so um, in the next talk, um, we are very happy to welcome um, uh, Dr. Arlene Chapman, who is um, a professor of medicine and chair of nephrology at the University of Chicago. And prior to that, she was professor of medicine um, in the renal division at Emory um, University School of Medicine in Atlanta. Her, um, for many years, her interest is in uh, adult polycystic kidney disease. Um, and it's our pleasure to hear her speak about uh, her research in this area today. Following her talk, um, we will get um, an update from one of our BC nephrologists, Dr. Mike Bavilacqua, um, in relation to uh, provincial changes uh, and projects that are going on for uh, acute polycystic kidney disease here in BC. So it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Chapman. Well, good morning. I, um I am Canadian. Uh, my mother's from Vancouver. I have many family here, so it's really a pleasure to be back. Um, this is a beautiful city, um, and it's so wonderful to see so many people out for uh, BC Kidney Day. So I am going to um, talk a little bit about something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, the title for the talk really was, What Have We Learned Over the Last 10 Years? and what, is, uh, what have we, uh, have, has taught us. But um, I thought in our current era, maybe the title should be, Can We Trump the Cysts? And um, I'm really glad that I'm still a Canadian because if things go in one direction, I probably will come back and join you in the near future. So um, I'm good. these are my disclosures for my talk. I'm a consultant for Cadman, Genzyme, and Otsuka. And uh, let me get right to the chase about polycystic kidney disease. It's the fourth leading cause of renal failure in both the United States and Canada. It does not have any racial or gender predilection. It's an autosomal dominant disorder. There are over three million people affected with this disease in the world, but only two thirds of those people know that they have it, so it's underdiagnosed. Um, even though the name comes from the kidney, the cysts are found in absolutely every organ, including liver, pancreas, spleen, and brain. And even though we don't really see patients with this until they're well into their adult years, this begins at the time of conception or in utero. So this is a busy table, and it's busy just to show you how many different hereditary cystic diseases of the kidney there are. And you can see on the top row that ADPKD is listed there. And for all of these diseases, including recessive PKD, tuberous sclerosis, glomerular cystic disease, medullary cystic disease, familial juvenile nephronopathies, and von Hippel-Lindau, ADPKD accounts for over 95% of all these diseases. So it really is the very most common hereditary cystic kidney disease uh, that we know of. We use cyst number to help us diagnose people with ADPKD, and I'll share with you some of the limitations based on cyst number in just a minute. And uh, if someone comes to a clinic and they have an affected parent, uh, the number of cysts that are needed to make a diagnosis are actually quite low. So if someone's under 40 years of age and they have a positive family history, only three cysts need to be detected bilaterally. Because cysts are common in the general population, if someone older comes to clinic, the number of cysts that are required for a diagnosis tend to go up. So someone between 40 and 60 years, it would be four cysts bilaterally. Someone over 60 years, it would be more than eight cysts bilaterally. And about 15% of the time, people will come to our clinic and there's no family history. And, and you know, that's with a lot of digging deeply, you know, getting a very strong family history, uh, corroborating uh, images in parents. And in that situation, the number of cysts required to make a diagnosis is much higher. It's typically 20 cysts or more bilaterally with a consistent phenotype, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So this is an example of four different patients who had come to our clinic uh, with cystic disease and even a question of whether or not they have ADPKD, the dominant type. And the one on the left is a, a young woman with normal kidney function, and you can see she has many, many cysts in both of her kidneys, and her kidneys are quite large. And this is very important because 
kidney enlargement is a uniform feature of ADPKD. So if you see someone with very small kidneys and lots of cysts, that is most likely not ADPKD. And that's why I said cyst number alone probably is not ideal for the criteria for making a diagnosis. The person on the right on the top is an older gentleman and he has advanced renal insufficiency. He's CKD stage four. He has no family history. And certainly if you counted the number of cysts that he has, he fits the criteria for ADPKD, but he actually has acquired cystic disease of chronic kidney disease. He does not have a hereditary form of ADPKD. And then on the bottom left-hand side, you can see there's one kidney missing. There's another kidney with just a few cysts around the outside of the cortex, and there's a very suspicious renal mass consistent with renal cell carcinoma. He had the other kidney taken out for renal cell carcinoma, and he has a parent with renal cell carcinoma, and he has von Hippel-Lindau disease. And again, you can see the kidney itself is not enlarged. It's just that there are many cysts in it. So that's why kidney enlargement is such a unique and uniform feature of ADPKD. And finally, on the bottom, we can see a 12-year-old with very severe disease, and he has an unusual form of ADPKD where he has lost part of the TSC gene and part of the PKD gene uh, together because they lie right next to each other on chromosome 16. And that's called the contiguous gene syndrome. So here are some of the systemic manifestations of ADPKD, and I show you liver cystic disease because this is our diagnostic friend when it comes to diagnosing someone with ADPKD. And so 85% of patients with ADPKD will also have cysts in their liver, and it is the only cystic disease in the kidney that also has cysts in the liver. So this also helps us to confirm whether or not someone has ADPKD. And you can see in this lady, she has much more severe liver cystic disease than kidney cystic disease. Her liver is very, very large. She has a ventral hernia. And she actually has one little segment of her liver that has no cysts in it at all. So these cysts tend to track in one of the eight segments of the liver uh, in a uniform fashion. So even though this liver is extremely large, if we check her lab tests, her liver function is completely normal. So her alkaline phosphatase may be a little elevated from some obstruction, but the rest of her liver tests are all completely within the normal range. And so this is a bit of a conundrum for us where these patients can become quite symptomatic. Uh, they can become malnourished, lose weight, have infections, and ultimately, maybe the best therapeutic option for them is to have a liver transplant, but it's very difficult to make that happen when their liver synthetic function is completely normal. The third manifestation that I want to share with you is much less common, but it's very important because it has a very high morbidity and mortality associated with it. And this is the intracranial aneurysms that can occur in ADPKD. You can see on the top left-hand side, there is a time of flight um, MR angiogram of the brain. That's the circle of Willis. And to the right on your screen, you can see a small cyst-like structure on the anterior communicating artery. That's an asymptomatic intracranial aneurysm that's about four millimeters in diameter. So we and many others tried to understand why ADPKD patients could develop aneurysms because when I studied this back in the 80s, it was thought to be that 40% of patients could have an aneurysm. And this is horrible if true because the outcomes of a ruptured aneurysm are, are very poor even today. And so we searched and searched and searched to find out what could be related to the presence of the aneurysm. And the only thing we could find was if another family member also had an aneurysm. So blood pressure, smoking, cholesterol, kidney function, age, gender, nothing made a difference. The only thing that mattered was if there was someone else in the family who had an aneurysm. So when we screened people to find out how frequent it really was, it really is only about 5 to 6% of patients with ADPKD. This is more than the general population, which is about 2%, but much less than the 40% that we were worried it would be. So the people we recommend screening for now are those who we know have a family member who have an intracranial aneurysm. So these are the things we see patients for, and this is pretty much where we manage all of our uh, complications of ADPKD. It relates to the renal manifestations, and it includes hypertension, gross hematuria, urinary tract infections, and nephrolithiasis. And this is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve of not having one of those complications. So you can see that by the time someone's 30 years of age, 
over half the patients with PKD will have had at least one of these complications. And they, it increases with frequency as they get older. So there's two genes that cause ADPKD, PKD1 and PKD2. PKD1's on chromosome 16, PKD2's on chromosome 4. When we see patients in the clinic, we can't tell if they're PKD1 or PKD2. They present exactly the same way. And the reason for that is that there are two proteins, polycystin 1 and polycystin 2, which are shown here, work as a single unit. So if something happens to the PKD1 gene, this entire unit doesn't function properly. Or if something happens to the PKD2 gene, this entire unit doesn't function properly. And that's why when we see the patients in the clinic, they look exactly the same way. So PKD1 is more common than PKD2, probably because it's a bigger gene that can be mutated more often, and it accounts for about 85% of all the patients. And the remaining patients um, are typically PKD2, about 15%. There's a slight difference in the two in terms of disease severity, and we know that PKD1 patients on average start dialysis around 55 years of age, and PKD2 patients start dialysis around 72 years of age. So it's a milder patient group, but again, a single person coming into the clinic, we really cannot tell uh, who's PKD1 or PKD2. And this has been shown by another group in France, so that not only are PKD1 and PKD2 patients different in terms of their age of onset of renal failure, but those patients who have a certain type of mutation in PKD1, called the truncating mutation, which means it just stops the protein development completely, has a more severe phenotype than the non-truncating PKD1 patients. So we're starting to get an idea of risk stratification who typically may have worse disease based on the type of mutation that they have as well. So there's a bit of a conundrum. I'll tell you right now, we don't do genetic testing for ADPKD unless we're really not sure what someone has. Um, and there's a reason for that. So if we do genetic screening for PKD2, we'll find the mutation about 95% of the time. If we do genetic screening in PKD1, we only find it about 85% of the time because it's a difficult gene to sequence um, and uh, it's very hard to identify in, in certain cases. In the United States, if one wants to screen for those two genes, it costs about $3,000. And so this requires insurance pre-approval, and it's very difficult to get. And once we find what we think is the mutation, then we have to confirm it in another family member. So this becomes doubly more complicated. And you'll see in a second, ultrasound is better, if not as equal to genetic uh, screening, and we can confirm a diagnosis by the time someone's 30 years of age with just a simple renal ultrasound. So this is an end-stage kidney. Um, it weighs 20 pounds, 10 kilograms. You can see there are cysts distributed throughout it. Um, and those are fluid-filled cysts. If you were to test what that fluid is, it's really urine in these cystic cavities. And what's fascinating, even though this kidney is very large, that the cysts are tiny proportion of the whole kidney. So we only see cysts in about 5% of the nephrons. It's a very focal disease. It's not diffuse like recessive PKD. And what happens is the cysts start in the tubule, they get a little larger, they get a little larger, and then they pinch off from the parent nephron, but they continue to secrete fluid on their own once they leave the nephron, and that's why the cysts get to the size that you see here. And the cysts usually make it to about two centimeters in diameter before pinching off. So almost all of the ones that we can see by imaging are already sort of autologous secreting cysts that are no longer associated with a nephron unit. And this is just a cartoon showing you exactly what I sh just uh, described. And you can see in the parent tubule, something changes in the cell. It's actually a second hit, another genetic uh, mutation in that cell, and it starts to change its characteristics. And it proliferates, and it grows, and it pinches off, and then it causes inflammation outside the cyst. And then there's fibrosis, apoptosis, and infiltration of inflammatory cells. And that's how this disease progresses. So this is inside a cyst looking out. And there's uh, little finger-like projections on the surface of the cells of the cyst. This is a human cyst. This was done by Jared Grantham. And that's called a primary cilia. And now PKD is considered to be one of the ciliopathies because these cilia, even though they look normal, don't work properly. They don't sense their environment properly. And uh, what we see here is that the polycystins sit 
on the primary cilium, and they cause changes in the cell in terms of their function. So they help regulate two important things. They help regulate how much calcium is in the cell, which is integral to every cell function, and it also regulates how much cyclic AMP is in the cell, which is really important when we start talking about treatment for ADPKD. And then what happens because cyclic AMP is changed is that the fluid flows not only too much, but it flows in the wrong direction. So it secretes into the cavity as opposed to uh, reabsorbing out. And this is really how these cysts continue to grow and get larger with time. So we know now what's important for risk pr prediction. So we know that PKD1 patients uh, progress to renal failure faster than PKD2. We know that if someone has high blood pressure, they're going to progress to renal failure faster. We know that if we can detect any protein in the urine at all, so dipstick positive protein, and that's in about 24% of cases, they will progress to renal failure faster. And we know that if someone has had an episode of gross hematuria, which I can assure you, your patients will always tell you if they've had that, they'll progress to renal failure faster. And all of these characteristics have now been shown to mediate their risk through cyst burden, which we can measure as kidney volume. So what we think is happening in this disease is that as these kidneys get bigger and bigger and bigger, at a certain point, there may be a loss in kidney function, but way before that, all these other complications like high blood pressure, blood in the urine, cyst rupture, pain episodes, infections, happen far before that. So this is what these patients really need their medical care for, uh, for most of their life. So we think, and this is a figure here showing kidney function as a line, and these are four different patients, all with a normal serum creatinine, all exactly the same kidney function, and you can see that their kidney size is bigger and bigger and bigger as they get older. And these kidney sizes are close to 10 times the normal size in this last kidney volume, and they haven't lost any kidney function yet. So this is quite remarkable that a disease can progress like this for so many decades while patients maintain kidney function and for the most part remain relatively asymptomatic. So we don't think creatinine is a very good way to follow these patients. So we really think that if we see patients cyst burden getting worse and worse and worse, their disease is progressing. And um, it can sometimes be sort of a, a false comfort to see a kidney value that's in the normal range because if these patients have kidneys this size, I'll show you in just a minute, they're going to progress to renal failure. So there was a study that began at the beginning of the millennium called CRISP. It's still going on. And this was really to try and figure out a way to measure progression of ADPKD and to do it in a relatively short period of time and to do it before patients lost kidney function. And so to do that, we had people that were relatively young, their kidney function was relatively intact, and we knew at the time that high blood pressure and protein in the urine were risk factors for progression, so we enriched the patient population with those types of patients. And we started to develop imaging for these patients. We had a phantom, we made this agarose phantom that had uh, olive oil and water in balloons to be cysts, and we made sure that what the MR scanners was measuring really was kidney volume, so we did a volume displacement phantom, and then we scanned them in the phantom, and, or the MR scanner, and then measured it. And we also had patients travel to four different sites to see whether or not different scanners got the same measurement. And as you can see, our inter- and intra-observer variability and our day-to-day -day variability was very, very good. I mean, this is a very stable, non-variable measurement. And for those of you that do GFR measurements, you know people with normal kidney function have day-to-day -day variability of somewhere between 10 and 15%. So this was very encouraging. So this meant if we had any changes, they probably could be detected without having to have too much of a change in kidney size. So at the end of three years of follow-up, these are the 241 patients who participate in CRISP. And if you look at the bottom left-hand notch on the y-axis, that's the upper limit of normal for kidney size in people without kidney disease. So all these patients have increased kidney size. And you can see some of these young folks have very aggressive disease where their kidney volume is already two, th two liters or more, and their normal kidney size is 150 ml. And there's some people who are in their 40s who actually have mild kidney size increase, but not that bad. 
So there's a wide range of disease progression uh, across these three decades of life. And the thing that we were quite impressed was, with was that when we measured cyst volume, it looked like a mirror image of the kidney volume that you see on the left-hand side of the graph. So we were encouraged that what we were measuring really was an increase in cyst burden. So we took those measurements, and to look at them in a linear fashion, we log transformed them. And this is the change in total kidney volume from the first time they did the CRISP visit to three years of follow-up. And so these kidneys turned out to grow about 5.3% per year. And that's equivalent to about 80 to 90 ml per year. And that's equivalent to a half of a normal kidney a year. So this is a very short time interval to be able to detect that much disease progression. And when this paper was published in the New England Journal, the number of clinical trials involved in ADPKD shot up from one clinical trial to about 22. So now pharmaceutical companies were quite interested in looking at therapeutics because they could test a drug in a relatively short period of time and know whether or not they were impacting disease burden. So we were also interested in the PKD1 and the PKD2 patients because remember I told you, you know, the PKD2 patients don't look any different uh, in the clinic. And so we genotyped these folks, and you can see here the PKD2 patients have smaller kidneys, which would make sense because they start dialysis about 10 to 20 years later, and they live longer. But what we were very surprised to see is that the kidneys grew at exactly the same rate. So both PKD1 and PKD2 kidneys grew at exactly the same rate. And so what that tells us is that the actually the biggest difference between the two patient groups is that the number of cysts that PKD2 patients have are much fewer than in PKD1. And it turns out that's the case. Uh, we had fellows that monks by candlelight counted the cysts on each MR image. And sure enough, there were 40% fewer cysts in the PKD2 patients compared to the PKD1. So this is taking those first three years of data, and we measured kidney function using iothalamate. So we used a true marker of GFR. And you can see if we just normalize it to baseline at zero, we can see a change in kidney volume already at year one. The star is statistically significant, and year two and year three, and it continues. But over the three years of CRISP, there was no change in kidney function at all. So if we had tested a drug in this patient population and used kidney function as our endpoint of interest, we would not have seen any therapeutic benefit, right? And so not only is it expensive to do kidney uh, trials for three years, patients don't want to be in a trial for more than three years if they can avoid it. So there's a lot of things to take into account when thinking about designing these trials. And so now that we follow these patients for about eight years, you can see kidney volume is still going up, and I can share with you that it's still going up even at 14 years. And now kidney function is going down. So there's a delay. These kidneys get to a certain size, and then ultimately they start to lose kidney function. So we thought this was interesting. We'd like to know, well, can we predict who's going to lose kidney function? Because when they started in CRISP, they all had intact kidney function. So we looked at their first kidney volume measurement, and then we did what's called an area under the receiver operator characteristic curve to see if we could predict who would develop CKD stage 3 based either on their TKV, their serum creatinine, their BUN, urinary albumin, MCP1, which is an inflammatory marker, or their age. And TKV was the strongest predictor. And it's not a bad AUROC. It's 0.84. That's a fairly strong predictive pool tool. And we actually could identify sort of a, the best case scenario set point for prediction. And it was about 600 cc's corrected for height. So that's equivalent to about 1,000 ml. So this meant that if someone had a TKV above 600, they were very, very likely to be in CKD stage three in eight years. So this tells us that if we can keep people below that set point, maybe we'll prevent them from going into CKD stage three. So the 5% per year you see here is the CRISP cohort. Some people, remember, on the right-hand side uh, towards the older age group were probably closer to the 2.5%. And those young kids were growing at 20% and 10% per year. So if we'd actually recruited those kids 10 years later, they probably wouldn't have qualified because they would have already been in CKD stage 3. So this is what we think is happening. Their GFR is compensating. So they have single nephron hyperfiltration. And they can compensate, and they can compensate until there's such a time where it's just too much cyst burden, and they start to lose kidney function. And I can tell you, when you look at 
CKD patients, PKD patients, once they have CKD, progress to renal failure faster than almost every other kidney disease group. They don't, it doesn't happen until they're much older, but they, once they start to lose kidney function, they almost always uniformly decline. And so here's where we found our patients having been diagnosed with their symptoms, and so hypertension was probably the earliest by TKV, then pain, then hematuria, and then now we know that ESRD probably is at about 55 years of age with a uh, percent increase of kidney volume of about 5.4% per year. So MR is expensive. It's that monk by candlelight measuring the slices of the kidney. This is not feasible in clinical practice. Uh, and so we can measure TKV reliably and accurately without having to do that. And we can do it, uh, for the most part, with ultrasound. We can do it with CAT scan. And we can do it with MRI. And so this is an example of how to measure kidney volume. And this is a standard operating procedure for ultrasound where you get the maximum length and the width and the depth. And you use an ellipsoid formula and you calculate their total kidney volume. And what I've done is I've put in just an example of some typical measures in PKD. So a length of 15, a width of 8, and a di uh, diameter of a depth of 7. And so that turns out to be a volume of 440. And that's a height corrected volume of 254. So even with a kidney length of 15, that's well below the 600, right? So they're below that threshold for progressing to renal failure. So we thought we would look at ultrasound in our CRISP patients and look at just length, volume, and compare MR and ultrasound. And so what we found is that they all do equally well, right? So this is predicting that CKD stage three, and these are their receiver operator area under the curve measurements. They all have about the same AUC value, about 0.84. And so then if we look at what the magic cut point is, I shared with you that it's 600 for MR TKV. It's about 630 for ultrasound TKV. And for kidney length, whether it's MR or ultrasound, it's about 17 centimeters. So when I see patients in clinic, if they're in their 40s and I get a kidney length of 13, I tell them they're probably never going to go on to dialysis in their lifetime. And that's a really big piece of news for those patients because they have family members who have gone on to dialysis or need a transplant, and it's really, really helpful. And then if I have someone who's, you know, 16 or 17 years of age and I can't fit their kidney length on my ultrasound transducer, which means they're about 18 centimeters, I know they have very aggressive disease. So you can use this as a way of identifying your individuals that you think need therapy or those that you can sort of manage a little bit more conservatively. So we've gone through this now, and we've created a classification system, and it takes age, serum creatinine, and kidney volume into account. It's called the Arazabal classification, and you can pull it up. It's on the public domain. It's on a, the Mayo website. So if you have a patient and you know their age, their gender, their serum creatinine, their kidney volume, you can figure out which class they're in. And so E is a high-risk class. A is a low-risk class, and this also helps you to decide, you know, how aggressive do you have to be? How much do you have to push fluids? Um, are there therapeutic interventional trials that those patients might be able to go into? And this is just an example of what a 1E, a 1C, and a 1A patient looks like. So we found that kidney progression in PKD is related to cyst burden, and this happens before loss of kidney function. All of our kidney function complications are related to cyst burden, and that TKV does associate with kidney function, uh, and this association gets stronger as time goes on, and that TKV really does predict decline in kidney function years before it occurs. And then I highly strongly recommend that you figure out with your radiology colleagues how to get them to give you a pretty easy and straightforward report. If it's not just for kidney length, even better if they can give you a total kidney volume estimate. And I know that from everywhere that I've gone, the radiologists really are interested in helping out in this. It's just a matter of an ongoing dialogue. So I'm going to finish with treatment strategies. And so this is a cartoon of a epithelial cell that makes a cyst, and you can see the polycystin 1 and 2 are up on the cilia, the little finger-like projection. <coughs> you can also see that there are polycystins elsewhere in the cell, the polycystin 2s in the endoplasmic reticulum, and you can see over on the left by TSC2 and TSC1 there's polycystin 1. 
but I'm going to focus primarily on um, the bottom part, on the basal lateral membrane where the vasopressin V2 receptor sits and goes through adenylate cyclase because this then links to that cyclic AMP I was telling you about. And I know as a province, you are all now deciding which patients should be considered for potential treatment. And so since Tovaptan is approved, or I should use the right name for it, but I know it is Tovaptan is approved for use here, um, I thought I'd share with you some data so this can help you uh, think about your patients. So if there was a slide out of everything that I show you, and, and this is available to anyone who wants these slides after the talk is over, this gives you today's experience in clinical trials in PKD. Uh, the Pratistatin trial was done in Colorado in young individuals, and that uh, was a positive trial. Uh, the Sirolimus mTOR trial was done in uh, Switzerland, was a negative trial. There's CRISP, that was the data that I just showed you. HALT-A was a positive trial. It was done here looking at angiotensin receptor and angiotensin ACE inhibitor therapies in PKD patients with hypertension. Uh, Aladdin, it was also a positive trial looking at somatostatin analogs. Uh, the Tempo 3-4 is a Tolvaptan trial. And then Averilimus is also an mTOR trial that was done in Germany. And so then what you see here, so what the left-hand graph shows you is what kind of patients there were in the studies, right? So um, it's their kidney volume by age. Um, and then their EGFR by age. So it gives you an idea of where in the course of their disease were they when they participated in the study. And this are the outcomes from these studies. You can see uh, Sirolimus had an improvement in GFR, but no change in uh, total kidney volume. Averilimus actually had a marked improvement in TKV, but also loss in kidney function. Uh, and here's the Tempo 3-4 study showing a marked decline in TKV and an improvement in GFR. And the Prevostatin study in kids who really had normal kidney function and didn't have anywhere to go up in their kidney function with a marked decline in their uh, kidney volume. And then finally, the low blood pressure study where patients who reached a blood pressure of 110 over 70 actually had a much slower increase in the rate of increase in their kidney size and an improvement in kidney function. So here are the vasopressin V2 receptor antagonists. It's down at the bottom where this medication works. It works on the V2 receptor, and it blocks cyclic AMP accumulation in the kidney. And when it blocks cyclic AMP production, then the cells don't turn over as fast, and they typically don't secrete fluid as much. And so this is thought to be the mechanism by which a drug could actually slow the rate of cyst progression. And so it's a very potent selective V2 receptor antagonist. Um, in preclinical trials, meaning in mice and rats and, uh, and other animal models, it slows progression of PKD. It um, had previously been approved to treat uh, hyponatremia, and now it's approved in Japan, Canada, and Europe as a therapy to slow down progression of ADPKD with rapidly growing kidneys. So the 3-4 trial uh, was the Tolvaptan efficacy and safety and management of ADPKD and its outcomes. It's phase three, meaning it was before it was approved. It was multi-center, it was randomized, it was double-blind, it was placebo-controlled, it was parallel group, and it really wanted to know whether or not Tolvaptan slowed progression in PKD. So there were 1,445 patients who participated. They were relatively young. They had to have significant cyst burden to get into the study, and they had relatively intact kidney function, and it was a global study. And about 404 patients had high-dose Tolvaptan, 120 milligrams a day, uh, 157 had medium dose, and 179 had low dose. And the primary endpoint was the change in total kidney volume measured by MRI, and there were other secondary endpoints. So <coughs> in this study showed that TKV growth, the primary endpoint, uh, was reduced by 49% from 5.5% per year, and that the estimated GFR loss on treatment was also improved by about 26%. Uh, going from 3.7 to 2.7 ml per minute per year. And this was over a three-year period. So here is the, the uh, change in kidney volume over three years. You can see the red is the placebo, and uh, the blue is tolvaptan. And so there's a slowing in the rate of kidney growth over the three years of treatment. And here is kidney function, and this is being looked at as a reciprocal of the serum creatinine 
And you can see again in the tolvaptan group a slightly slower rate of loss. And re remember, these guys have relatively intact kidney function, so they're not yet losing that much kidney function. And this study was the same duration of time that I showed you from CRISP. So they're a little further along, losing a little bit of kidney function, and there was a, a positive impact of the therapy in this situation. And then um, I, s I apologize that this has moved to the right, but the risk of worsening kidney function was also reduced uh, uh, in the tolvaptan treated patients. And then uh, kidney pain requiring narcotics or admission to the hospital, so severe kidney pain, was also reduced in the patients who received therapy. So there were fewer ADPKD adverse events in the tolvaptan group, but they actually had more drug-related events and that was really related to how the drug worked. Since it blocks the vasopressin receptor, these patients become extremely thirsty right away because vasopressin levels go up when the receptor is blocked. And that's the one thing patients will tell you even before they start going to the bathroom a lot is that they are so thirsty. And then the other related uh, um, side effect of this is that they do go to the bathroom much more because they're making a very dilute urine and so they have a polyuria and they have a high urine volume. And for some patients, they didn't want to do that for long periods of time, and that was part of the reason that they stopped participating in the study. So those patients who were in that 3-4 study went on to what's called an extension trial, and this is very typical for drugs who have not yet had approval. It allows the patients who didn't have a chance to be exposed to the active therapy, the placebo group, to be given uh, treatment. So this is an open label. That means everyone gets the medication now. And so 976 PKD patients received open-label telvaptan, and this was dosed up to what was the highest dose that they could tolerate. So this includes those who got treatment in the study and those who were on placebo in the study. And so in this extension trial, there was significant improvement in the EGFR slope when switching from placebo to telvaptan. And again, it was about the same amount of improvement, about a 1 ml per minute per year about a 21% treatment effect. Um, and it dis it, there was a time difference leading to an increased proportion starting CKD stage three compared to their own earlier decline. And this gives you an idea of what the data looks like for the placebo, or we, here we call placebo delayed treatment, and then the tolvaptan treated patients in the 3-4 study, and then what, what happened to them when they went into the open label uh, component of uh, the extension for tempo 4-4. So the five-year early treatment slope in Tempo 3, 4, and 4, 4 combined remained different from the delayed treatment placebo group uh, in Tempo 3, 4, and so this had a 20% treatment effect. So there was some post hoc analysis that we did, and this included looking at CKD stage, so do patients early versus a little later in the course of their disease still get benefit, and also whether or not it had an impact on albumin excretion, which we know associates with um, progression. So these are the same patients now that were randomly assigned to the split dose Tolvaptan, um, and so the clinically similar beneficial effects of Tolvaptan were seen across all stages of patients when they came into the study. So CKD stage one, two, and three demonstrated similar benefit. And when we looked at albuminuria, and this was done on a spot urine sample in the morning, uh, subjects who had higher uh, albumin to creatinine ratios had higher blood pressures and total kidney volumes and lower estimated GFRs at the beginning of the study, which is what we expected. And during follow-up, those with higher ACRs was associated with a more rapid decline in GFR. Uh, but not with the increase in t total kidney volume. So there's probably a signal here that's about the function of the kidney as uh, not so much as the all over total kidney volume. And the albumin to creatinine ratio rose in the placebo treated patients and it went down in the tovaptan treated patients uh, over the first three years. And the beneficial effect of tovaptan on TKV growth and EGFR was strongest in the patients who had the highest baseline albumin to creatinine ratio. So again, it marks for what patients might be worth identifying for possible treatment. So to determine whether the kidney hemodynamic effects or pharmodynamic effects of the drug were dependent on GFR, there was an acute study done so that they were studied at baseline and after three weeks of treatment and they were given increasing doses at week one, two, and three. And the changes in markers for acaresis, meaning free water clearance, plasma osmolality, 24-hour urine volume, and 
plasma copeptin, which is a marker for vasopressin, and kidney injury were assessed. And the patients had, with decreased kidney function, they had a smaller response to tolvaptin uh, for TKV and their urine volume and osmolality, but they actually had the largest increase in fractional free water clearance. So it certainly suggests that the drug is working in those more advanced patients. Uh, it just wasn't being manifested in the first three weeks by changes in kidney function or TKV. So I'm gonna finish very quickly about blood pressure because it's something that everyone can do today and I think um, it's a difficult thing to manage. It's a chronic issue that needs patients to come back and, and really partner with their physicians. And this is just a, a snapshot of what's happened to the management of blood pressure in PKD. Um, we're much more now using ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers, and our blood pressure goals are looking like they're getting better. This is a, a study done in London, England uh, by Cindy Patch, and she showed that blood pressure targets had improved dramatically over the last three decades. And so there was a HALT study that I mentioned earlier uh, that was performed in the United States looking at very low blood pressures in these patients as compared to standard blood pressures. And we hypothesized that those patients who were treated to a low blood pressure would actually progress slower. So I'm going to show you just the, the, the final outcomes of the, the low blood pressure study group here. And the study A patients were young, they were healthy, they had intact kidney function, but they had to have high blood pressure to participate in the trial. And uh, the outcomes of interest for study A was, again, uh, total kidney volume change. Um, and I'm not going to talk about study B because those were adma more advanced patients. And then there were a number of secondary outcomes. So this is what happened to their blood pressures. There was a very nice separation, about 13 millimeters in systolic blood pressure and about 9 millimeters in diastolic blood pressure. And we used urinary aldosterone to tell us whether or not we were blocking the renin angiotensin system. And sure enough, uh, they certainly dropped their urinary aldosterone excretions with um, treatment and more so in the um, uh, rigorous blood pressure control group, although not statistically different. And when we looked at their change in TKV, we actually saw that um, the low blood pressure group had a slower rate of growth, and this now is over five years, not a three-year study, um, by approximately 15%. So just by lowering blood pressure, and it didn't matter if these folks were on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker or a combination therapy, we were able to slow their growth rate by about 15%. So getting someone's blood pressure down to 110 over 70 is, is an ongoing partnership, um, but it's something that can be done today in the clinic with the medications that are available to us. And you know, in the United States, is not approved right now, so this is something that we're targeting uh, very, very heavily. And this is what happened with their GFR slope. And again, by the end of the uh, study in the chronic slope, the difference here was about P equals 0 0.05. So a savings of about one ml per minute per year in the low blood pressure group. So low blood pressure treatment in young, healthy, hypertensive PKD patients with RAS blockade is tolerated, it's safe, and it results in a slower rate of TKV growth over five years. And I'll finish with just suggesting that as time goes on, drugs that we can find that reduce proliferation, fluid secretion, normalized cell-cell interactions are really important in PKD. That's the primary abnormality. And if we can target this early, and I'm thinking you know, young adults and at some point even children, uh, we really would be able to impact this disease and prevent patients from going on to renal failure. So thank you very, very much. It's a pleasure being here, and I'd like to acknowledge these folks.